am tired of communities of being of faith being weaponized and being mischaracterized because the only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination. And so I just have to get that out ahead of time because it is deeply disturbing, not just what is happening here, but what this administration is advancing is the idea that religion and faith is about exclusion. It is not up to us. It is not up to us. Um, <laughs> it's not up to us. Also, I'm deciding that the correct interpretation of biblical scripture is entirely up to us because being intolerant is mean and doesn't help me get elected to Congress. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. We're back from CPAC. We had an absolute ball. Got to meet a lot of you guys. Went to some pretty cool parties. It was very refreshing to be able to meet so many conservatives, uh, to be able to meet so many people working in the system or working in media. But coming back from that, I do have to point out, and many of you may have noticed this already, but I haven't been posting as often as I used to. And this has been going on for the last few months or so because I've been in a bit of a slump. It's due to a mixture of a lot of different things, some of them political, some of them apolitical. But CPAC snapped me right out of that. I am once again high energy and optimistic. Gone are the days of being moderate to above average energy and pessimistic. We're going to get back into the groove of things. And I sat down yesterday. I brainstormed a list of different video ideas that we're going to do, a couple new series that we're going to experiment with. And this is all in addition to the normal flow of content. Because at the end of the day, we've got a subscriber goal to hit by January 1st, 2021. So we're going to act like it again. And all I need from you guys is to keep leaving likes on the videos, keep leaving comments on the videos. That's it. That would help tremendously. And we've also, more importantly, got a president to reelect and I spoke with a lot of anti-Trump and never Trump conservatives at CPAC this weekend many of whom told me that I changed their opinion on Trump so we're having an impact which is epic and speaking of epic I think we're gonna do an epic spring tour visit some college campuses so if you're a student who's a part of a conservative campus organization you want me to come to your school sometime this spring before school gets out go to heckoffcommie.com slash speaking and media I'll put a link in the description but anyways moving on to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, firstly we're gonna establish some context and we're gonna go through the footage and explain why virtually everything that she's saying is incorrect so this footage is from a hearing where one of the witnesses who was a biological woman that identifies as a man and is named Evan Milton is suing a Catholic hospital in California for not performing a hysterectomy on her, quote, because the surgery was related to her gender transition. And so we're going to talk a lot about the implications of religious freedom once we actually start to go through the footage. But really quick, I think that it's important to note how the idea of ethical medical practice has changed. So like the whole point of medical practice used to and ought to be centered around optimizing a person's ability to flourish. Like our brains and our senses are designed to bring us into contact with reality and any thoughts that disguise or distort our reality are just misguided and the only way that we can flourish as human beings is to embrace truth and live in accordance with it you know you might be able to find some subjective satisfaction in believing and living out a falsehood but that person would not be objectively well off it's like these questions are philosophical right like medical practice doesn't answer the question of its own purpose that's a philosophical question and so now what we're seeing as this ideology continues to infiltrate every facet of our culture is this idea that medical care including mental health care should be less about what is objectively best for the patient and more about fulfilling that patient's desires you know you may have noticed that uh, the term we hear now from these activists and politicians is medical service providers provider instead of the outdated medical professionals like you know the difference being that a medical professional would prescribe care to you based on objective science that's in alignment with reality whereas a medical service provider you know they don't necessarily care about that they just exist to provide the service to you regardless of whether or not it's actually right for you and this is why a lot of these transgender people complain about being discriminated against like in this case for example uh, a woman wants a hysterectomy it's like okay cool what are reasons why a woman might need a hysterectomy well she could have ovarian cancer she could have uh, cervical cancer she could have have uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, you could have fibroids, her uterus could be uh, prolapsed. Like there are reasons which warrant this procedure. There are problems which can be solved through this procedure. Women who are transgender, they go to these doctors with perfectly healthy uteruses, Uter uteri, uterus. <laughs> these women go to these doctors with perfectly healthy uteri and they, they request that they be removed because it will help them transition into being a man. It's like that's a separate topic than what we're going to talk about here. But a couple points really quick. Firstly, it's impossible to transition from being a woman to a man. It's like biologically impossible. It is philosophically impossible. It just isn't, it's not true. And, you know, we can do a whole video about that if you're interested. Just let me know. But 
The reason that people who get these surgeries have to go through a long recovery period is because their body regards what just happened to them to be a wound. It thinks that it's been mutilated, which isn't exactly far from the truth. And secondly, even if the surgery did accomplish what it sought to accomplish, like on a practical base, even if it actually were changing the person's gender, it hasn't shown to be successful at reducing the symptoms to a normal level. And that's because it fails to solve the underlying psychological problems. It is true that there is some evidence which suggests that the symptoms decrease, but that's relative to transgender people. If you look at the suicide rates relative to the general population, it's been shown to still be like 19 times higher. So that doesn't actually scream success to me. And maybe that's because surgically altering someone's body to try and align their objectively existing physicality with their mental delusion doesn't actually work. I don't know, it's just a thought. And this example is also very similar to the baker, Jack Phillips in Colorado. Remember, it's not just that you'll be tolerant. You're gonna bake the cake, you're gonna bake the freaking cake and you're gonna like it because otherwise you're discriminating. At least that's what they say, but of course it's not true. Uh, the hospital, just like Jack Phillips, is not discriminating against the individual. The hospital would gladly provide them any hospital service of which they were actually in need, the same way Jack Phillips would have sold the gay couple anything in his bakery. But what the hospital will not do is perform an unnecessary and psychologically harmful operation to conform to this gender ideology that's only existed for a few decades and has only actually like gained traction in the last 10 years or so. The same way Jack Phillips would not be made to create a cake for a same-sex wedding. It's not that they're discriminating against the individual, it's that they're discriminating against the particular service. Those are categorically different. They are not even remotely the same, but yeah. You know, we're gonna go through that footage now and talk about why it's all nonsense, so yeah. Very epic. Uh, I also love how they titled the clip. They're like, AOC just flipped the entire religious freedom argument on its head, like, really? We're supposed to believe that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has the mental capacity to actually, like, dissect an argument so effectively that it's just decimated, it's just flipped on its head. We've been debating this for hundreds of years, but it took someone with the sheer brilliance, the, the raw intellect of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to finally settle it once and for all. That's what they want you to believe. And by they, I mean the guy that probably wrote that title and I think that we all know what he looks like but we're gonna get into it I'm high energy I'm feeling good I'm experiencing this hearing and I'm struggling whether I respond or launch into this question as a legislator or from the perspective of a woman of faith Right. So firstly, she claims to be a woman of faith. She actually claims to be a Catholic. And I'd like to think that this is just her being confused about things, which is quite often the case, um, because she's not actually a Catholic. But I think that a lot of the time when these leftist politicians cite their own faith, they're doing it because they're trying to dilute the legitimacy of what that faith, which is always Christianity, by the way, actually entails. Like they're misrepresenting the Christian doctrine so that anyone who's actually interpreting it correctly and living in accordance with it will lose grounds to do so. Because as we'll watch her get into, the argument's going to be, well, it can't actually be religious freedom since we've just learned from the austere religious scholar Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez that Christianity isn't about all this mean judgmental stuff. So anyone who's being mean and judgmental and not totally accepting isn't actually Christian. They're just posturing as such to justify their bigotry. So that must mean that there's no real purpose to, to laws protecting religious freedom. So we should just get rid of them. Like that's the strategy. And it's because Christianity cannot coexist with leftism. It simply cannot. It simply cannot coexist with cultural Marxism. And whether or not you're a Christian is not necessarily important for this discussion. Like, I'm not trying to preach to you right now, but chances are that if you're a conservative who believes in the traditional American values, you're probably deriving those from Christianity because this country has always been a Christian country. But, you know, we've got AOC claiming to be a Catholic nonetheless, and we could break down her actions and analyze them within the context of scripture, but no one is perfect. We're all hypocrites. I very frequently act in ways that I know to be wrong, but the difference is that I know that they're wrong. So it's one thing to succumb to immorality in a moment of weakness, and it's another thing to not even acknowledge that the morality exists in the first place. And the biggest litmus test for this would be abortion. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is an outspoken advocate of abortion. The Bible is extremely clear about not only the immorality of taking taking innocent life, but also the validity of life that's in the womb. That's basically all there is to it. And it's not like to be rude, like, well, you can't be in the club. It's more of a like, oh, well, you believe in abortion access for women. That goes against the Bible. And Catholics believe that the Bible is the word of God. So you're actually not a Catholic. You know, it's completely binary. You cannot be a Catholic and support abortion. It's impossible. So if you support abortion, that's your belief. I wish you the best of luck with it. But you aren't a Catholic, like by definition. Because I cannot... It's, it's very difficult to sit here and listen to arguments in the long history of this country of using scripture and weaponizing and abusing scripture to justify bigotry. White supremacists have done it. 
those who justified slavery did it, those who fought against integration did it, and we're seeing it today. And this one's gonna be bad out of context, but like, you know, what's wrong with bigotry, right? Like she says, oh, religion's used to justify bigotry. Yeah, what's your point? Bigotry is literally defined as being intolerant towards something, which means that unless you're completely accepting of all things, like the left would like you to be, you're a bigot. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with bigotry. It's wrong to be bigoted towards races of people. We all agree on that, but there's nothing wrong with being bigoted towards certain ideas or behaviors. And in fact, Christianity advises us to be exactly that. Christianity tells us to not be tolerant and accepting of all ideas and behaviors. AOC says that's wrong because bigotry, it's like, okay, what's wrong with bigotry? Bigotry can mean a lot of things. Should we all be accepting and tolerant of all ideas and behaviors? That's the only way for us to truly free ourselves from this bigotry. But Christianity does not tell us to be bigoted towards other people. And, you know, you can, of course, find examples of people who are racist or who hate gay people for whatever reason, and they try to justify that by citing their religion, but those people aren't actually Christian, or at least they're disobeying the scripture, just like um, how she said Christianity has been used uh, to justify segregation and slavery. Like, that's true, but it's the same case in that the Bible doesn't condone slavery or segregation. It actually is very much against those things. And this is a separate issue. It's very complex, but basically it boils down to the context of what is called slavery within the Bible, uh, how that differs from the slavery that we're talking about and also how the Bible's teachings about human beings would undermine any justification for that slavery. So um, that's important to note. But back to this idea of religion justifying bigotry. She's making the argument that religious freedom, which, by the way, is a linguistic perversion of our freedom of religion guaranteed in the First Amendment, it's only used to justify bigotry. It's like, okay, cool. So the problem here is that she has a fundamental misunderstanding of what our freedom of religion actually means and uh, what rights are actually guaranteed through our Constitution. And I really think that this is going to be the meat and potatoes of this whole thing, or uh, the, the tofu and insects of it, I guess. So basically, the best way to explain it would be starting with uh, our freedom of religion. So a lot of times people say, it's not freedom of religion, it's freedom from religion, man. And that's sort of true depending on the interpretation, but I think that freedom of religion is better. Uh, it's a better way to describe it because, you know, we have freedom from religion in the sense that the government can't make any law that establishes a religion, nor can they make laws that are intended to favor for one religion over another. And the reason for this isn't so that you are totally free from religion, it's so that you are free from whatever the government would be trying to force you to worship. Um, and that's the other part of it, which is that the government cannot make laws that ex uh, excessively interfere with the practice of religion. So it's not that you're totally free from religion, it's that everyone has a right to worship as they may, regardless of your opinion on it, and the government can't do anything about it. This is the origin of the separation of church and state, which, by the way, doesn't exist. Uh, you, you won't find that written in any founding era document. That's in reference to a private correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and some other guy. But what that really means is just that the government can't do anything to limit religious expression in public. Now, this is really where it gets important because you have a right to believe whatever you want, right? But the government has decided that your right to act on those beliefs is not absolute. We don't really allow for human sacrifices to take place anymore, right? And why is that? Because it violates the rights of other people. And this is where we get into how the Founding Fathers viewed rights, which was negatively. The Founding Fathers believed in negative rights, which means I can say what I like, I can believe what I like, etc., and I can only be stopped if it explicitly infringes on someone else's rights. Having negative rights means that you can do things without having to be subjected to the will of other people. So, so long as you're not violating their rights. So when we look at our First Amendment and how that's set up uh, with the right to act on beliefs not being absolute, that means we cannot act right? Because to act would be to, to do something that violates someone else's rights. But refusing to bake someone a gay wedding cake because of your religion, that is to not act. That is to refuse to act. It is in no way violating any of their rights. The left thinks otherwise because they have a positive view of rights. A positive view of rights says that I am entitled. A positive view of rights says that I am entitled to your labor, so you will make me that gay wedding cake, regardless of whether or not it goes against your religious beliefs, because if you refuse to do that, then you are actually violating my rights. This goes completely against against our traditional and correct understanding of rights. Like to deny someone your service for religious reasons does not prevent them from getting uh, the service from someone else. They're more than welcome to do that. It has virtually no effect on them. Conversely, to mandate that someone go against their religious beliefs, to provide a service to you, to literally force them to act in accordance with what you want against their will is an explicit violation of their rights as guaranteed by the Constitution. We limit religious expression that interferes with the rights of other people. Refusing service does not interfere with your rights because you do not have a right to the labor of someone else. Sometimes, especially in this body, I feel as though if Christ himself walked through these doors and said what he said thousands of years ago, 
that we should love our neighbor and our enemy, that we should welcome the stranger, fight for the least of us, that it is easier for a rich man, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into a kingdom of heaven. He would be maligned as a radical and rejected from these doors. Oh man, it's like, come on. Jesus would be maligned as a radical. Like, really? What about you? I mean, we've drifted so far away from being a religious society, yet you've still managed to become a radical, like, even for where we are now, how far we've devolved, and you're still considered a radical. Just good work. And you can also very easily tell how she's trying to contort the scripture to fit with her ideology. Like, I really love this idea that Jesus Christ would be rejected because he's just too accepting. No, Jesus would be rejected because we're too accepting. Are you kidding me? If Jesus Christ came back and saw the way that the left celebrates abortion, drag queen story hour, mutilating your body because you think that you're a different gender, he would be like, no, no, you're not supposed to do that. And then the ACLU would issue a statement calling for the re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ right after he gets like kicked off Twitter. And I can also tell you the purpose for each line that she employed in her little monologue there. So when she says, love thy neighbor, what she really means is accept and tolerate all behaviors and lifestyles. And when she says, welcome the stranger, what she really means is allow for unrestricted migration from all over the world, or when she says, uh, fight for the least of us, and it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. That's all alluding to class conflict and income inequality issues, which she, of course, champions as a socialist. And we know that she's using these lines to allude to these different issues because people on her side do this very often. So we've kind of gotten used to it by now. But um, just for clarification, I figured that we'd provide some context. So firstly, we're taught to love our neighbors. This is true. But oftentimes we forget what immediately precedes that teaching, which is that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind. This is the great commandment. And we often hear the phrase, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. That is true. We are taught not to hate people, but rather to hate the evil forces that have occupied them, uh, which have compelled them to sin. And to love our neighbor is to want what is best for them as defined objectively by our creator. And again, I'm not preaching. I'm just trying to explain it. But you know, in order to truly love someone, you have to want what is best for them. So if you're citing the word of God who calls for us to love our neighbors, you have to understand that the context of that is firstly, you are to love your God with all of your heart and soul and mind, which means you are to accept his teaching as true. And then you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself, which means that you are to want what is best for them, which is the pursuit of what is good and what is true. And you are to disprove of their sin which serves to corrupt their being. So basically, you can love the person without loving everything that the person does. And in fact, you shouldn't love everything that they do because people tend to do things that are bad for them. Uh, and the next one that she mentions is that we are to welcome the stranger. And that's true. But of course, there's, there's more context. Um, so all of Christ's welcome is within the context of truth with full disclosure and respect for the free will of the individual. He's not going to compromise with you, but he's also not going to force you to do anything, right? Like he's basically saying, ahoy, it's me, Jesus, uh, here's the truth about this whole existence thing. Here's the game guide. Don't use cheat codes. Don't use hacks. Otherwise, you're going to get a VAC ban and you only get one account. So probably shouldn't do that. And that's the model, which we're taught to follow, right? We're taught to bring truth into the world and welcome everyone to accept it and live by it. But this does not mean that we are going to welcome the world into the faith so that the faith can adjust itself to the demands of the world. This means that the faith is to maintain its integrity and all those who accept it and strive to live by it are welcome. Uh, but then she goes on to talk about how we're taught to fight for the least of us. And I think that she's referencing the, the least of these passages in Matthew, but it could be wrong. Um, this is often used by people on the left as evidence for the whole Jesus was a socialist argument because he's saying that by not helping those in need, we basically basically haven't helped him. Um, but the language of the scripture is pretty clear that he's like referencing specifically to other believers that are in need because he refers to them as his brothers. And that language is always used in reference to brothers through faith or brothers through blood, not just like the universal suffering of humanity. So the idea would be to help our fellow Christians who are dependent on our hospitality for their ministry. This is not like a blanket statement about the church's obligation to help the poor, nor is it a policy prescription for the federal government's war on poverty straight from the big man himself. Like, obviously, it's important for us to help those in need, but the idea that we're to do that by having more money taken from us by the federal government, which then goes to pay these bureaucrats six-figure salaries for overseeing the whole operation, which has been proven, by the way, to be ridiculously ineffective. Uh, it's just ridiculous. And then the last one, the, the rich man is bad one. There's a few different interpretations of this that basically arrive at the same uh, conclusion. Uh, some people argue that they misspelled the Greek word for rope and wound up with camel. Some people think that the eye of the needle refers to a gate in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem that you wouldn't fit through unless you dismounted and unloaded your camel and then you bowed your head. So basically it comes down to humbling yourself. 
reducing yourself both physically and metaphorically, right? Like it doesn't mean that if you are rich, you can't get into heaven. It actually means that it doesn't even matter. It means that what matters is your character, not your wealth. And your actions define your character and we are all called to be charitable. So there's nothing wrong with being rich as long as your greed and obsession with wealth have not corrupted your character, right? And if you look at the 1% in this country, they tend to be extremely generous. So again, her concern is less with them following the scripture and more with them paying more taxes to subsidize her socialist agenda. And I know, and it is part of my faith, that all people are holy and all people are sacred unconditionally. And that is what makes faith sometimes, that's what, what prompts us to transform because it is unconditional. Again, she's not telling the truth here. Like if all people are sacred, why is it okay for us to kill the ones not born yet? Are they not human beings? If they're not human beings, like what else are they? What could they possibly be? And I think what we're finding out is that you don't actually believe what you're saying. You only use it when it's convenient for your political agenda. And I especially love the unconditionally part, like really? So the condition of being born doesn't matter? Like I'm glad we can agree. I actually agree with her completely, but unfortunately I don't think that she agrees with herself. But yes, if it is true that all people are sacred regardless of any condition, whether it's their age, race, gender, sentience, consciousness, viability, any metric that people who view personhood as conditional try to establish, all of its garbage garbage. If you are a human being, you are sacred, like team human every day, baby. Anytime you try to rationalize the devaluing of human beings to fit your political agenda, you're either going to devalue people who you wouldn't actually consider to be without value, or you're going to overvalue things that don't deserve that value, like insects. And this is what happens when you are governed not by morality, but by divine logic and ideology. It's not about that it is up to us to love parts of people. We love all people. Very clever, AOC, very clever indeed, but she will not that smart. I mean, she's right that we love all people, but that's only after she says that there are parts of people that we can love. That's not true. There are no parts of you. You are one human being. You might have certain interests, opinions, behaviors, whatever. Those are not different parts of you. Those are all part of one thing, which is you. And we love you because you're a human being, but that doesn't mean that we have to love everything that you do. And in fact, it's because we love you that we are called to speak out against certain things that you may do that are not good for you. She's, again, she's just misrepresenting this to forward her political agenda. There is nothing holy about rejecting medical care of people, no matter who they are on the grounds of what their identity is. There is nothing holy about turning someone away from a hospital. There's nothing holy about about rejecting a child from a family. There is nothing holy about acting in accordance with your faith. It's like, what an idiot. I'm sorry to be insulting, but to preside over a hearing that centered around a woman wanting an operation that would not solve her underlying psychological conditions, nor would it actually transition her to a man, and to pretend that it's equivalent to denying service to someone because of who they are. Like, are you even paying attention to what's going on around you? It's not like she wanted a flu shot and they were like, No, we hate you because you're different. It was actually that she wanted a service that not only was wrong medically speaking, but was wrong within the eyes of their religion. Oh, well, there's nothing holy about denying a child a family. I agree. I know what she's alluding to. She's talking about preventing gay couples from adopting, but family is defined literally as parents living together with their children, and parents is defined literally as a mother and a father. So technically she agrees with us because she's saying that children should not be denied a mother and a father, which I agree with completely. There's nothing holy about writing discrimination into the law. And I am tired of communities of being of faith being weaponized and being mischaracterized because the only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination. There's nothing holy about writing discrimination into the law. Like, isn't that what you're literally doing? Are you not literally trying to write discrimination into the law to prevent Christians from refusing to provide services which go against the religious beliefs? I'm tired of it. My faith commands me to treat Mr. Minton as holy because he is sacred, because his life is sacred, because you are not to be denied anything that I am, that I am entitled to, that we are equal in the eyes of the law and we are equal in my faith in the eyes of the world. And so I just have to get that out ahead of time because it is deeply disturbing 
not just what is happening here, but what this administration is advancing is the idea that religion and faith is about exclusion. It is not up to us. It is not up to us to deny medical care. It is up to us to feed the hungry, to clothe the poor, to protect children, and to love all people as ourselves. I really hate that last part. I really do. What she's saying is actually quite disturbing if you really listen to it. And I can understand if you didn't. But the first half of that last part is stuff that we've basically already gone over. But notice how she said that religion isn't about exclusion. This administration is trying to advance this idea that religion is about exclusion and that's wrong. The reason that she's saying that is because, as I said earlier, her ideology cannot coexist with religion, which is just a less obvious way of saying Christianity, which is what she really means. Since we all know that she would not be reading any sort of criticism to uh, the Muslim community, right? And as we said earlier, Christianity is not exclusive. All are welcome, but there are conditions that have to be met. That's the whole point. And unfortunately, those conditions go against her worldview, probably because it's those conditions which built this evil, oppressive, and unjust nation of ours, right? That's why they have to be demonized and marginalized. And then, you know, she goes on to say, it's not up to us. It's up to us to feed the hungry and to clothe the poor. That's very telling. It's not up to us to decide. It's not up to us. Basically, what she's trying to do is make true faith subjective so that the government can become God. When she says us, do you really think she means us? She doesn't. We are society, and remember, we cannot be trusted to be charitable through the free market. She means us as in the government, as in it is the role of government to feed the hungry and to clothe the poor. Shh, shh, more money. Give us more money. Give us more power. Give us your rights. And she has the audacity to finish it by saying we have to protect children. This is coming from the woman who's working with the same drag queen that created a Netflix show that sexualizes a 10-year-old. Like, I'm not having fun anymore. Hey guys, if you like this video, all you have to do is three things. That's all I ask. Leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, and subscribe to the channel. That's it, you're done. Toll is paid. What was that other thing I asked you to do? Oh, if you go to a school and you want me to come talk at that school, go to the website, fill out the form. Uh, yeah, very epic. High energy once again. High IQ, nothing's changed. What else is high? I suppose that's basically it. Uh... It's funny because I'm very like ready to go, obviously, but it's also very late and I've been working on this all day. So my mental state is not in alignment with the fatigue of my body. So that's going to catch up to us at some point. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting. But thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Poof.